Hey everybody, what's up? All right, so in this video, what I wanna talk about is what is the best language to learn for the next project that you want to pick up, or really if you're just trying to learn a, a new language. So I feel like there's a lot of disconnect out there between uh, what language you should use to, to build your next project. And languages are like religions, basically. So if somebody spent 10, 20 years in, in a particular religion, they're gonna be pretty adamant about that religion, obviously. So we spend a lot of time with our favorite languages. But what you should know about programming languages is that they're just tools to get a job done. So whatever job you're trying to do, it really determines what tool you should use. And a lot of experienced programmers, they, they know that. But um, some tools, you know, they if, if everything is a nail, or I'm sorry, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's a, uh, a common phrase that people have. And we talk about that in programming too. So if all you know is PHP, you feel like PHP you can write video games and mobile apps and all that. And maybe it can, it just won't do it as performant or uh, faster or better than, than other languages that are out there. So that all, that all said, let's go ahead and talk about really the godfather of all programming languages, and that is the C language. That has now come out, uh, it came out 50 years ago. So it's been 50 years since Dennis Ritchie created the C programming language at Bell Labs which is the precursor to AT&T uh, before they got broken up in a monopoly. So even before really my time, I was born in 1981, and I don't really remember all, like anything called Bell Labs. I just remember AT&T. But all that said, AT&T actually is a, a big part of like where we are with modern-day computers. And I think I mentioned this before, but like Xerox came up with the operating system that influenced Steve Jobs to create the Macintosh, and the rest is history. Uh, but when we're talking about the C language, I've actually been doing programming for a long time now in a professional capacity, and I've never really had to write C programming. So I've dabbled in it. I've done tutorials. I, I've never really written anything in C, though. I, I've never really found the need. And the reason why is I'm going to cover that in this video. So the C language came out over 50 years ago now. And when we talk about C, C is actually considered the godfather language because the compilers that were written to create C programs, they're basically the same compilers that were written to create programs like Python and PHP to dynamically interpret code. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to beginner level developers, probably not. And hopefully I'm not explaining any of this wrong. I'm not an expert. I, I've just been doing this for a long time, but I'm not an expert. Uh, so that said, when you're talking about what is the best tool for the job. Like if I were going to create my own brand new programming language, I would probably build the compiler that that is in that C uses. I would have like some sort of C compiler creating some higher level language. That's probably what I would do. If I were creating like a game engine or something like that, I would go with another systems level language, something like C++, which is still widely used across gaming applications because they need to have all the speed, uh, they need as much speed as they possibly can have. And you can see that it's of the family of C. So basically C++ is not the same thing as C. Some people say it's C with um, object, objects or object-oriented programming, but that's really, it's not the same language at all, but uh, C++ was built from C. And you could say that pretty much for every other modern language out there as well. So what are those languages? They're really systems level languages, meaning that they use the operating system to actually have to, to compile. So they're, they're used to like, okay, I need to do something with the display graphics or I need to do something with the printer or something along those lines. Um, they are able to create binary executables that can be executed by the operating system. So whether it's a Unix-based Linux operating system or Windows, they create these binary executables. So that is considered to be like a systems level language. They're compiled, meaning that all the code that you write is actually run through a compiler and all the checks and balances pass, even though you could still have bugs and runtime bugs and things like that. But um, the bottom line is that the programs, the executables are executed directly by the operating system for which they were created uh, or, or run on really. Um, so what are other systems level languages? You could look at Go. Uh, Go is a popular language now that is created by Google. Um, and this is also considered to be a systems level language. Although compared to C and C++, it handles memory management for you. So that is like a big, separates the, um, you know, separates the pack really when it comes to writing your programs because when you have to deal with memory management, 
that's where you get into Stack Overflow is where Stack Overflow gets its name and all that, where you run out of memory. Um, so on the heap anyway. So anyway, like I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, but what I can tell you is that there's languages that are designed to be system level languages. Uh, one of the newest ones is Rust, which comes from the Mozilla family. So that said, if you're going to write something that needs to be like bare bones, and you are writing it for an operating system, you want it to be compiled, statically typed. If none of that makes any sense, um, a good example of statically typed is something like TypeScript, even though, <laughs> this is a, a caveat, with TypeScript, it, it, it's actually like creating type safe JavaScript code, which is dynamically interpreted. But the difference with TypeScript is that you end up compiling it to JavaScript, which is a dynamically duct type language. So I'll get more into that in just a second. Uh, but that said, there's a lot of scripting languages. So those languages that I just mentioned, Rust, C++, C, and Go, those are all considered to be um, compiled languages, right? They, they, they create executables that can run on your operating system. However, there are a lot of programming languages that we fight over, like which is the best, which are all considered to be scripting languages that are dynamically interpreted. So that means that the interpreter, and what is even the interpreter? The interpreter is a computer program, so it's something that's a compiled program using one of those languages I mentioned, like with Python, and really any of these languages I'm about to mention, they're all written in C, basically. So it's, an inter it's a computer program that is used to execute program instructions written in one of the higher level languages. So what does that mean? What is the higher level language? It's something like Python. This is a dynamically duct type language, and it's... Um, the interpreter, like I said, is written in C. And then you have Perl, same thing. PHP, the same thing. Ruby, the same thing. So all these languages, are they can be considered scripting languages as well as JavaScript. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is like it's all about the best tool for the job. So when you talk about, oh, I need speed, I want you know build the fastest program ever, well, you also have to consider the fact that some of these lower level, you know, C level languages, C++, memory management, where you have to get involved in that, it takes you a lot longer to write the program. And when we talk about speed and productivity, um, there, there are two different things. There, there's the speed of the application and then there's the productivity, like the speed of actually getting the application working for what you need it to be. So we make, um, we make decisions basically on which tool is the best for the job. And sometimes the best tool is the, the tool that does the most for you. So all that said, what we have in modern day, well, really, let me touch on Java and .NET as well. So when we talk about Java, Java is a, it's a compiled language similar to C++ and C. However, the compiled language runs on a virtual machine. Um, so in the instance of Java, if we're looking at Java, you're writing Java code that is compiling down to something that runs on what is called a uh, Java virtual machine or the JVM. So the idea behind that was that if anybody had the, the Java JVM uh, installed on their operating system, it could run any sort of Java code, no matter what it was, whether it was a computer, a satellite, a uh, DVD player, even though those, those aren't even around, I'm showing my age, but you get my point. Um, if you write your code in Java, it should be able to run anywhere. That was kind of the, the, the promise. And um, for reasons I'm not gonna really go into, that was just sort of a, you know, a pipe dream. Like we always try to get this right once, run anywhere type of thing. And even when we're dealing with uh, things like Flutter that or uh, you know, like like Flutter, for instance, it, it builds mo mobile apps for you, or even um, React Native. What we find is that you can't simply write one code base without having a bunch of edge cases to make your code base actually work on iOS, Windows, Android. You know what I mean? Like, there there's always some sort of problem. So write once, run anywhere has always been sort of a pipe dream. And then let me go ahead and mention C Sharp because that's in the same definition as Java. So that is actually also a compiled statically typed language. Uh, but instead of the JVM for C Sharp and .NET, it runs on something called the CLR, which is the common language runtime. But it's the same thing. It's a virtual machine. And that is executing all of your C Sharp code into machine level code uh, that, is, that is compiled and run on your operating system.
so why do I mention all this? I mention all this because the new kid on the block is WebAssembly, and WebAssembly is a byte level, low level language. It stands for, or the abbreviation is WASM. And you can see it's a binary instruction. So basically, what we're seeing now in the wild is that there's a lot of languages now that can compile to WASM. And although WASM was originally intended to just run inside the browser, what we're actually seeing is that we're seeing a bunch of frameworks and everything that are cropping up uh, that are making WebAssembly way more than just code that runs inside your browser. So although it does have the ability to run inside your browser, and it is close to native speed, meaning that when you have an application that compiles to WASM and it's run inside the browser, it's like, I say close to, to your native machine, it's like half that of C++ running natively, at last I checked. But that said, that's way faster than something like JavaScript running in the browser. So when we want to like envision a world where we can use a browser and it doesn't matter if we're on an iOS or an Android or a desktop computer or a PlayStation 5, we're going to be able to run augmented reality and, and maybe virtual reality, reality games. And, um, the, you know, the, the idea is that because every device has a browser, if we could find a faster way of executing code within the browser, that could really open the door to modern day next level applications that we're still sort of yet to see. Um, but that all said, Wasm now is more than just providing a way to run code faster in your browser. It's extended um, into now server side development, uh, video games, and more. So some of the criticism here is like, well, we're sort of recreating the Java virtual machine type of thing, or at least the you know the, the envisioned goal of that. But the reality is is that at least with WebAssembly, nobody owns it. It's an open source community. It was created by all the biggest names in tech, and. Um, yeah, it's not one particular company trying to capitalize on this one, you know, write once, run anywhere sort of runtime that we all like dream of having. So to sum all this up, where are we? If you're trying to write next level applications, I would definitely give WebAssembly a look. I would also consider a systems level language. If I were going to create something like Photoshop that runs on your computer uh, desktop or a mobile app or whatever, you're going to need as much hardware performance as you possibly can get. Uh, you don't need a, a bunch of bottlenecks when it comes to like dynamically interpreting code. And what does even dynamically interpreted mean? It means that the code, like with Python, for instance, you have your C-based interpreter, which is written in C, and it's actually looking at your Python code line by line and figuring out how the interpreter then figures out how to convert that to uh, systems level code. So that means that it's not as fast is something like C sharp or Java, assuming you write the programs correctly, but you can do pretty much everything with any one of these languages, but it doesn't mean you're going to do it right and that you're going to succeed at it. But um, all this said, the point of this video is really just to give you an idea on the fact that uh, there are differences between these languages and it doesn't matter wh where one can actually perform better than the other. There's a lot of things that go into whether or not you should use that language for your project. And it really, and to me, you know, personally, it's about how can I get the job done as quickly as possible uh, through some, you know, happy path, POC, whatever it is like that I'm trying to do, I'm usually trying to save as much time as possible. So that's why we use Python. That's why we use Ruby. And that's why we have Ruby on Rails and Django. And yeah, there's faster frameworks out there, but a lot of times you don't need that speed. If you're learning the code, I recommend you check out my website, CodeHawk.com. My courses are fast to the point without the fluff that you'll find on other competitor sites like Pluralsight and Udemy. One of the reasons why you'll want to learn with me is that I'm a self-taught engineer myself. I never went to school for any of this stuff. I've been doing it for over a decade now professionally. The biggest reason you should use CodeHawk is that it's one price for everything. I try to make this as affordable as possible. Instead of having to purchase 15 to 20 different courses on Udemy or an expensive monthly subscription to Pluralsight, it's one price for everything on CodeHawk. Front end, back end, full stack. It has courses on all the latest web development technology. The courses range from beginner to advanced. So if you want to learn the latest web technology, give CodeHawk a look. There's demos for all of the courses that are out there right now. Uh, in addition, there's also my personal vlogs, which I'll be adding more to. So content that I don't release to YouTube is available on CodeHawk.